from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. Or Angels Fear by Manly Wade Wellman. Manly Wade Wellman was among the most popular writers for the legendary Weird Tales magazine, where some 50 of his stories appeared. His 65 books include biographies, regional histories, mainstream fiction, mystery novels, sci-fi, and fantasy. Where Angels Fear, issued in 1939, was one of his finest ghost stories and is based on actual experience in a real house which Wellman and his father visited. Half a mile from McCormick's cabin, a paved highway crossed the rutted woodland road, and here Post held aloft in the misty darkness an electric light. Muriel Fisher paused in its brightest glow and turned up her speckled, good-humored young face. Let's interview that whiskey, Scotty, she said. McCormick smiled and drew the silver flask from under the till of his old shooting coat. He was a tall, gaunt, young man, made sturdy just now by rough, heavy clothes. Between his plaid scarf and the brim of his felt hat, there showed a fine, bony face, gallically wide in jaw and brow with a narrowness through the cheeks. Drink, he invited and drew the stopper for her. She drank with honest heartiness, her bandana framed face tilting back under the white light seemed to have lost a touch of its healthy pink, but she looked steady enough in her tweed suit, turtleneck brown sweater, woolen stockings and oxfords. That braces me to the adventure, she said, handing back the flask. This is like the beginning of a Sherlock Holmes story. Old clothes, thick walking sticks, a bottle of liquor, and a dark road to travel. Her spectacles turned to scan the extension of the road on the other side of the pavement. It seemed subtly to dwindle, to become no more than a trail in the deepening fog. Only, she added, Sherlock Holmes was too rational to believe in haunted houses. His creator wasn't, said McCormick, and drank in turn. The potent whiskey cut from his mouth the savor of those sardines they had eaten together just before starting into the night. Conan Doyle believed in ghosts, fairies, and God. What time is it, Muriel? She peeled down and knit a glove and looked at her wristwatch. Twenty minutes after eleven. We'd better hurry if we reach this boogie bin of yours before midnight. They crossed the highway and plunged into the half-gloom beyond. Only a narrow strip of the sky hung between the two blocky masses of trees, and from there it filtered a slaty blue light. The moon would be full, or almost, but the holy mist clouds obscured it. Underfoot the going was uneven and turfy, and the tip of McCormick's walking stick sent the pebble scuttling. Muriel started violently, laughed to deprecate her own nervousness, and fumbled for a cigarette. McCormick found himself grateful for the brief flare of her match. Tell me all about the house, Scotty, she begged. It's a treasure trove of goblins, if it's authentic, he complied. I've seen it only twice, and by daylight both times. It has a traditional look, all right. A big square-roofed ruin, two stories high, on a rock above a stream. The local gossips tell me that it was built maybe 60 years ago by a young couple who were found one morning in an upstairs room, hanging by the necks. Suicide, asked Muriel, or murder? Nobody's sure. After a while, some relatives moved in, a man with his wife and young son. During the first week, so I understand, 
The mother died suddenly and mysteriously, and the little boy was so scared by something that he had to be taken to a hospital. Next morning, the father was dangling and dead in the same upstairs room. That was the last of regular residents at the place. Muriel drew up her shoulders. I don't wonder. What about the poor little boy? He didn't entirely recover. The grocery man down at the village says he's at the state hospital. Mental case. Can't rightly remember who he is or how he got there. Quiet, harmless, but they don't dare leave as much as three feet of rope where he can get to it. And nobody's lived in the house since, prompted the girl. Well, not lived in it, McCormick told her. Once a convict escaped from the prison camp and ran away through the woods. That was year before last. I was spending the summer at my cabin. The state police tracked him to the house and cut him down from the hook where he was hanging. Whew! Cast Muriel with shivery delight. In the upstairs room? In the upstairs room. McCormick lighted his pipe. Its bowl sent forth a soft rose-colored glimmer that relieved his strong bony features with an impression of whimsical gentleness. The night was strangely still except for the footfalls and respirations of man and woman. No insect chirped or creaked. The autumn leaves did not rustle on the branches. McCormick thought that cold perspiration was starting on his forehead, but perhaps it was a condensation of the mist. I dare hope that nobody knows we're out ghost hunting, he remarked. Some heavy-handed jokester might dress up in a sheet and come to call. Have you brought any charms along? his companion asked. Wolfbane, a crucifix, holy water? Anything of that description? McCormick shook his head. I'm out to see ghosts, not drive them away, he replied and smiled. He had an agreeable smile, but with his pipe fire half screened in ashes, his face looked like a clay mask in the blue dimness. Muriel Fisher felt less cheerful than she had at the beginning of the walk, and far less skeptical of ghosts than when she and McCormick had shared sandwiches and coffee in his snug cabin. That cabin seemed far away just now. But she refused to wish herself back. She had come out here tonight expressly to see a haunted house. Where's the scene of all these gothic horrors, she asked after a time. Almost directly ahead, her companion informed her. Yes, here's the creek and the road ends. There was a bridge once, I dare say, but not now. The trees shrank away from this spot and the fog-strained moonlight was almost strong around the two adventurers. Before them, set deep between rocky banks, ran black swift water. McCormick stepped cautiously to the very edge, peered down and then across. It looked narrow by day, I must confess, he remarked. However, I think I can jump it. He flung his walking stick to the far bank, gathered his body suddenly and straddled his long legs into a skipping leap. He seemed to have be swing across the stream, gained the rough-looking rocks beyond and turned back. His thin face was like a genial skull in the moonlight. If you go only a little way down, it's narrow, he called to Muriel. But she too flung her stick across. Don't coddle me, she cried gaily. I can jump as far as you can. She suited the action of the word and bravely, but her stride could not match McCormick's and her skirt hampered the sissory thrash of her legs. One blunt Oxford touched the edge of the far rock. It crunched and crumbled beneath it. She felt herself falling backwards. McCormick, moving quickly for so big a man, shot out a hand and clutched her by the wrist. With a mighty heave, he fairly whipped her to safety. Thanks, Scotty, she gasped and straightened her spectacles. Then the bandana that was bound over her head and beneath her chin, peasant style. You spared me a cold bath. They both smiled and breathed deeply in mutual relief. I take that escape as a good omen, she went on. Now, is this the haunted house? It looks to be. They had come into a larger clearing, but here the mist had thickened to a pearly cloud. In its heart rose a great cliff-like structure with towering walls and a flat roof. The walls had weathered to a gloomy night gray in which shuttered windows formed in distinct deviations. A porch had once run the entire width of the front, but the roof was collapsed, the pillars fallen, 
and the floor all but in ruins. Isn't that a lightning blasted oak in the front yard? asked Muriel, pointing with her recovered stick. I suppose owls hoot in its branches to foretell the death of the heir. There aren't any heirs, McCormick reminded her. All of them died or were hanged. Come around to the side. There's supposed to be an open window there. He led the way up a rise in the overgrown yard and through thick-set brambles that may once have been a bank of roses. Three windows were ranged in line on the right side of the house, and the rearmost showed blacker than its fellows. McCormick pushed close to it, knee-deep in rank shrubs that showed one or two wax-petaled flowers. No shutters, he reported, and the glass is all broken out of the sash. Where are you, Muriel? Right with you, came a reply from just behind his arm. He turned, set his hand to her waist, and lifted her lightly through the opening. Oui, it's dark, she cried in protest as her feet came to light on the dully echoing floor. At once she struck a match. It gave blotchy glimpses of a big crumbling room, apparently running all the way from front to back of this part of the house. McCormick struggled in through the gap where the window had been. His bracing fingers found the wood, spongely dry, as if the house had been decaying for six centuries instead of sixty years. I brought no flashlight, he informed Muriel, only a candle. You did exactly right. Why chase away spirits with electricity? She watched as he ignited the fat tallow cylinder, which yielded a clear, courageous tag of flame. Now where, she asked him. There should be stairs leading upward, he said, and moved across the room. Its boards creaked and buckled under his shoes, and crumbs of plaster fallen from the shattered ceiling made harsh, crunching noises. The candle showed them a doorway through which they walked together. Beyond, they found themselves in a central hall. Here was the flight of stairs they sought, its railings falling away in a heap and clotted blackness above. The plaster of the walls had broken away in sheets. Again they were aware of their presence in the house of Decay's very soul. Do we go up? inquired Muriel, her voice automatically hushed, and McCormick nodded it and again led the way. His left hand held the candle high, his right clutched his stick tightly, as though to be ready to strike a blow. He could not have told what he feared to meet. The upper landing was encircled with moldy-looking doors, two of them fallen from their hinges. McCormick went to each. Muriel closed at his heels and held in his candle for quick examination. He stopped at the right rear chamber, just above the window by which they had entered. Here's our haunted room, he announced. See the hooks there on the back of the wall? The hooks he mentioned were set well into the plaster within inches of the ceiling. Strangely enough, for that house of ruin and rot, they appeared to shine in the candlelight, as if new and rustless. Elsewhere clung a strange pall of gloom, though the flaked and ragged wallpaper must have been reasonably light in color. I wonder if a hundred-watt lamp would help this room any, grunted the tall man. It looks to be in mourning for the four who were hanged. But we'll douse the candle anyway in a minute. Hold it, Muriel, while I spread something for us to sit down. From a big pocket of his shooting coat, he fished a folded newspaper and, spreading it out, covered a space against the wall directly beneath the hooks. Now, he said, light another cigarette if you like. I'll put a fresh fill in this pipe. Ready? He took back the candle and blew it out, and they sat down in the dark. After a blinded moment, they saw that a dim radiance stole into the room. There must be chinks in the window shutter somewhere, and the moon, now close to zenith, was fighting its way through the mist so as to peer in. The, do the two ghost challengers sat shoulder to shoulder, each silently grateful for touch of the other. Muriel again peered at the illuminated dial of her watch. It lacks only seven or eight minutes of midnight, she answered in a half whisper. Scotty, you're quite willing to stay? Strange as it may seem, returned McCormick, I'm suddenly quite willing to depart, but I won't. I came here to see ghosts, if there are any, and I don't intend to leave so close to the proverbial witching hour. 
It was not much of a success as careless chatter. Silence fell again, and awkwardly. Muriel broke in, in a voice no louder than a sigh. Look! They both saw, or thought they saw, a stir and the soft shimmer of gauzy light. It might have been streaks of silent rain falling, had the roof been open. Again, it might have been the rhythmic creeping of long spider spare legs without a tangible body. McCormick felt something fasten tightly upon his bicep and started violently, but it was Muriel's fingers closing for comfort on his flesh. Her hand slid down into his own grasp. He, too, regained something of serenity and strength in being able to reassure her. Scotty, she was breathing at his ear. I wonder if there's something the matter with the doorway. Is it closing? He stared. His eyes had grown more used to the almost darkness. Not closing, he made easy-sounding reply. The door is off the hinges. There it leans against the wall, but the opening does look smaller somehow, growing narrower. And lower, she added. It's only an optical illusion, of course, as she chuckled nervously, but I'd bet good money that you'd have to stoop to get through it. Again, the illusion of bandy leg lines stirring in the room, this time very near. McCormick, at least, fancied that he heard something like a stealthy scramble, and once again... He lifted the stick that had never quitted his strong right hand. His left squeezed Muriel's wrist, trying to win back some of the calmness he had transmitted to her. But when he tried to fix his eyes on the spidery movement, it seemed to fade to retreat. He echoed in his heart the words of his companion. Optical illusion, of course. I'd have to stoop too, Muriel was telling him. It looks like the door to, to a dollhouse. Again her chuckle, more hysterical than before. Chin up, McCormick exhorted her. When we get up from here and walk towards it, they'll be with and height enough. Are you so anxious to see ghosts now? She fairly quavered. McCormick did not wish to heighten her terror by denying. He did not wish to tempt any strange and sudden visitation by agreeing. He therefore kept his peace and quartered the floor and walls with his straining eyes. Once again, something rustled nearby, menacingly stealthy. He leaned hard against the wall and drew up his legs so that his feet would come under him and bring him, if necessary, swiftly erect. Too much imagination, he accused himself. This was undoubtedly the way that physical investigators conditioned themselves to experience phenomena that never really happened. No wonder people had been frightened to hanging themselves on those hooks overhead. But he was too rational a being to be thus stampeded. Optical illusion, he insisted once again to his thundering heart. At most, none of the things he almost saw or heard would be too terrible to face, a blow of a stick. But what if it lashed out and met no substance? I keep thinking I hear voices, Muriel said once again. Not human voices. Not exactly. They're too soft and... Like whispers, McCormick suggested, as casually as he could manage. No. Less audible than that. They're like an echo, a memory. They can be felt, not heard. Imagination, said McCormick rather rudely. His eyes sought the door again. There was no door. Only blank walls, solidly pale in the dimness. He felt a tightness on his heart and throat, and with real savagery tried to persuade himself that this was no more than curious, notable, absorbing. We're shut in, Muriel said aloud, and the ring of her apprehension in her voice made him jump. Next moment a bell rang, clear and far away. Rang again, again, again. It's midnight, he said briskly, and with the greatest relief he had known in years. Hear that clock striking? Let's clear out and head back to the cabin. He rose to his feet, feeling unaccountably light, as though he had floated up. Once more he led the way, trying to make out the vanished door through which they had come short minutes ago. Muriel's cry of agonized terror brought him up short. Scotty! 
Look back there where we were sitting. What do you mean? He spun around, still with that strange, airy lightness. Against the wall dangled two silent figures. Bands or nooses of rope held them by the necks to the gleaming hooks that jutted close to the ceiling. The figures hung limp, lank, unmistakably dead. One was long and thin, in rough coat and trousers, the other smaller and unmistakably feminine, wore a tweed suit and scuffed walking shoes. To McCormick, those two corpses looked vaguely familiar. Again Muriel's fear-loud cry beside him, Scotty! I can't see you. Where have you gone? I'm right here, he said hoarsely, and turned in the direction of her wail. He could not see her either. He put out a hand to touch her. He could not see the hand. Immediately he knew what man and woman were hanged on the wall of the haunted room.